guys, today I want to talk to you about something that is a very hot topic within the managed services industry. Um, and in actuality, it's it's more than just the managed services industry. The, the challenge that exists that I'm talking about is um, how do you find good people? How do you find good employees? This is not this is not a, a requirement just for the MSPs. Obviously, this is something for everyone. And there's always like certain challenges that all businesses will experience when they go through this challenges like, you know, does the person really align with what we want to do? Are they a good worker? Do they have a good work ethic? Are they reliable? Do they actually know what they're doing? In the tech industry, it's uh, more compounded, maybe is the right word, because there are so many different uh, words that get reused, that get thrown around that don't really mean anything, they have nothing behind it. They just have like a contextual meaning almost. Um, and everyone uses them. And so we all think that they, we're talking about the same thing. Uh, an example of what I'm talking about though is when we're looking for a technician to hire um, back in my MSP days, we would be, okay, well, we need a tier two technician and we need a tier three technician. And we would go out and start looking for someone who's a tier two or tier three. And we would receive a lot of people uh, who were good. Um, as far as maybe work goes, or as far as, you know, what they knew was, but their level of skill was not aligned with what we had in mind when we were saying tier two, tier three. Um, the largest discrepancy this came in uh, was regarding when we had people who were IT guys or IT girls, really, IT guys or girls, um, but they would be coming from the enterprise space or, you know, from uh, internal IT. Um, as opposed to the managed services industry, as opposed to from the channel. And what we found was that the level of competence, generally speaking, in terms of technology, like in terms of being an IT person, um, was usually way less than what we would need or what we were seeing in the managed services industries. Um, there was a simple reason for this, uh, but it's not really talked about too much. It's more just like accepted and understood. But Basically, what I'm saying is like a someone out of a tier, someone out of internal IT would be coming through as like I'm a tier two, tier three technician, and they would be classed as a tier one, if even that, at, at an MSP. Um, so I mentioned there's a simple reason for that, and we'll just talk about that really quick. It's just that as an MSP, generally speaking, it's a it's not a a fact every single time, but it's a pretty much accepted rule that you can say that within an MSP, you're going to be exposed to a lot more technology um, options. You're going to be provided with different scenarios of things to break. It's going to be a lot more of a wild ride. You're going to have to be much better at thinking on your feet as opposed to a specific company running their in, their internal IT um, where you have a limited set. You know, you may be really, really good at the parts that you know that you deal with, but you have a very limited amount of exposure to those technologies than what you would have at an MSP. Um, so <clears throat> because um, that exposure is less. And then also because the stress is significantly less than what an MSP is. It's almost like you're in a fight and you're just constantly fighting every single day because um, your reflexes, your instincts get significantly honed much better. Your ability to troubleshoot and think is, gets quick, uh, gets significantly faster and more precise because you're, you're constantly going to the next critical thing. You're basically like a firefighter uh, at an MSP almost. Um, now that's not our ideal situation. It's just how things end up being. Uh, when you're running a single business as internal IT, it's fine. Uh, you know, you may have your good days and bad days, but when you're running every like four or five businesses internal IT, which is what an MSP does, right? It's just all compounded together. And so instead of having one bad day, one good day, you're having two bad days because you've got two businesses now, and they both have their bad days on different times. And then just expand that over. And over again, as, you, as your client base builds out, and you're basically at a point where you're only going to have, and I, they're no longer bad days, good days, they're just hectic days. Um, and so that constant pressure, that constant grinding, the constant leveling up, because you're just jumping to the next one, the next one, and you have a wide variety of exposure. It just happens to be that when we say a tier one, tier two technician as an MSP, we generally mean maybe a tier two, tier three technician out of uh, internal IT, maybe, not, not everyone even at that point. Um, so aside from that, like the challenge that we have is how do we actually find someone? We don't, we can't even articulate what, who it is we're looking for, right? Um, 
we can't say tier one technician, tier three technician. We can't say like, oh, you have to be good at problem solving. That's not quantifiable. Um, so this becomes very difficult. Like not only are we dealing with the same challenge that everyone else is dealing with from a business perspective when it comes to finding talent and making sure that they're um uh making sure that they're not um that they're actually you know have a decent work ethic and so on but we actually have to make sure that they actually can handle a the stress of, of an msp because it is a stressful life and then b that they're actually technically competent um, and can match uh, what's going on so this conundrum has resulted in for the most part most decent msps that you're talking to when they're looking for new talent uh, they're going to be they're going to have accepted the mindset that they have to find someone who may not know a lot technically. They may not have a lot of knowledge, but they have the skill to think. They have the critical thinking skills and ability to do stuff uh, in terms of figuring stuff out. And then they'll deal with the training internally. Uh, and that's basically becoming like an accepted thing. With that being said, I mean, with that comes the responsibility to train. Responsibility to train means that you have to have time to do it. And if there's anything that almost every MSP is short of, it's on time. Um, so this really is just like expanding the problem out over and over again. Like, how do we actually find someone? Um, we basically have to hold hold it together long enough for us to find someone who can figure stuff out and then actually spend the time on them, invest, them, invest in them to actually come in as a tier one technician, maybe even an intern first and then go through that process of learning your systems, how things work, technology, and then going from there. Uh, the good news is, is that if the person's motivated, I mean, it can be it can be months, three months before they start actually providing returns, like so people can grow. I, when I started in IT uh, many years ago, I was an intern originally, I was just following around technicians at the company that I was interning in. Um, I was doing some basic, uh, you know, grunt work, um, slapping things around, some backup checks and whatever. Uh, when I started for real full time, I was a tier one technician. And what they said at that time, I was just taking phone calls, logging tickets, checking backups, you know, simple things. But it was not very long. It was two, three, maybe four months before I started doing more than that. And the reason why it happened was because, you know, I, I had a lab at home. I had my own equipment at home. I was always playing with stuff. I always I was always messing around uh, for the longest time. Even before I was an intern, I, I was always messing around with computers and stuff like that. And my goal was always to figure stuff out. And so within a few months, I had started seeing problems come up that I thought I could fix. And then I would go figure it out. And I was always reaching for more than where I was at and which would, which would allow me to to grow rapidly within within a few months and a year. I was lead technician. Um, so the point is that the good news is that if you find someone like that, they can grow really fast and you'll have a return on your investment really quickly. The bad news is, is that it does take time. Number one, it's the personal drive of that person, right? We used to tell people when I interviewed for people for the MSP that I was at in telecom, I would always tell them that, you know, our limitations on how far you can go is based solely on your, your ambition and your drive and desire to actually make it that far. Like we will assist you in any way that we can to help you get there, but it's going to have to come from you. Um, you know, which was always good because it let people put things in perspective to say like, am I really ready for this? <clears throat> um, with that being said, there are like, what about the other side of it? Like, you know, I, I mentioned the MSPs, they don't have time. So how do we find someone who's actually good like when we're we're really looking for a tier three technician or a tier two technician how is it that uh we're gonna find someone who can actually qualify for that one of the things that i did um at uh in my spare time for msp geek was i started putting together a, a list of things or, or really like qualities or, or quantifiable areas of what i would expect a tier one tier two tier three technician to accomplish um, part of this and, and my good friend, Gavin Stone over at Ninja right now, Ninja product manager, he and I argue about this all the time, um, or we used to argue about it all the time when we both had time to do it. Uh, but you know, what is required for tier one technician? What is required for tier two technician? And, and in his mind, he was saying that in today's day and age, the things that were needed in the past are no longer needed. Whereas in my mind. Uh, a good 
way of like in order to be a decent technician you have to have a good foundation uh, a good knowledge on the foundational skills of how things were at some point um it's all good it's all well and good to say like the on-premise systems don't matter anymore and those are legacy technology that we don't care about but in the end the technologies in the cloud today uh, hide a lot of the underlying framework and how things work in the architecture that we don't know about. Um, and so having that knowledge from the on-premise legacy technology, like what Gavin says, is actually a very big boon and helps us uh, in our work today as cloud. We may not have to use the knowledge the exact, the exact same way anymore, but we do still have to know it or it's helpful to know it. But I digress. That's uh, an argument that we have going back and forth. Um, the point of this is that, that when we are talking about interviewing skills, we're talking about interviewing technicians, a lot of people don't focus on knowledge and they focus on, can you actually solve a problem? And so they come up with like scenarios and, and like, walk me through this troubleshooting scenario. What would you do in X, Y, Z? And I did the same thing in my interviews, but towards the end um, of my time at, the, at, at Intellicom, maybe the last couple of years or so, I was honestly getting sick of sitting in interviews over and over and over again. And um, we needed a way to quickly triage, to like rapidly triage the person coming in to say like, are you actually a good person in terms of meeting our qualifications for a tier two or a tier three technician? And so we came up with, essentially it was knowledge testing questions that we would ask. We would have the screening people ask them over the phone and transcribe their answers word for word. and the key that we're talking about isn't, do you know the knowledge? The key is, how well do you know what you're answering? And so having a question that's an easy answer, like yes, no question, or you know has a textbook answer, doesn't really help. The, the key that we found was if we can ask questions that were open-ended, um, that allowed the technician who's interviewing to explain themselves we could, by context of their answer, essentially gauge whether or not they would meet our requirements for Tier 2, Tier 3, and so on. So when we're looking for a new person and we don't have the requirement that they come in as a Tier 3, yes, absolutely. We're testing for thinking ability, critical thinking, problem-solving skills, and culture alignment, and so on, because we're okay training them. But when it comes to the point where we don't have that time and we need someone to hit the ground running hard, we're looking for someone who's already gone through a decent MSP or gone through some other transformation in their life, personal labs at home, you know, solid education or constant drive to, to learn things or whatever it is that did it that actually gave them that knowledge and that level of understanding. So we have, I basically came up with a few questions, like six or seven questions or so. Um, I'll give you a couple of them as an example. Uh, but the key is, is that again, we're not looking for the answer, we're looking for how they answer. And because how they answer will provide us context in terms of how long of a technician or how good of a technician or how experienced that technician is in what they've been doing. Um, there are also a couple like pitfalls built into some of the questions and I'll give you one as an example so that you understand what I'm talking about. It's not designed to trip them up on purpose. It's designed to see, again, our goal is not to test the knowledge, it's to test the technician. And so, seeing where they take us with their experience, it just gives us more data on how what, where their experience lies and how comfortable they are with what they're talking about. The final thing that we always looked at is also the amount of time spent in the industry. Um, you know, a technician who has been in the industry for 12 years and is grading at tier one level answers or maybe tier two level answers is not going to cut it. Um, you know, not because they're not a good tech, you know, I'm sure they're good, but they're not going to cut it for where we want them at that point. Because as a technician at 12 years, they should be like hitting the markers across the board at tier three if they had that drive. Right. And so that was another reason, another way for us to test that context um, in this process. So I'll give you an example of a couple questions I mentioned. Um, you know, what is the purpose of the Windows file extension is one of the answers. Now, people can say like, well, you never need to know that. That's not really relevant. It's true. It's very much less relevant than it used to be. Uh, it's still relevant. There are still, you know, the default application assignment by file extension. There's a lot of nuance behind the last three letters of a file name. Um, 
And so based off of how they would answer the question, we would be able to tell whether, excuse me, one second. Okay, sorry about that. I have to clear my throat. Um, so the level of how well they answered that question, what context they provided in their answer would give us an idea of what their experience level is and how much they uh, they actually know about what they're doing. For example, a textbook answer on that question would tell us, okay, so they read the book, maybe they got a certification or whatever. Do they really know it though? You know, if someone starts talking about the actual specifics of how it works and uh, the registry behind the scenes or, you know, open width and a few other things that keywords that they can drop that would actually tell us like, okay, they have some experience here. And the other thing about it is like each of the questions would be a ranging grade essentially. Uh, or a sliding scale. It wouldn't matter if they scored a question as a tier three in one area or a tier one in another area, because it would just balance out where they have experience. So the question specifically covered a few different areas, such as networking, the Windows OS itself, um, you know, some hardware uh, and things like that. Uh, another one of these questions uh, that I mentioned I'll give you an example on was like, when would I use STP on the network and what are the various versions, right? That's a pretty vague question, especially if it's being asked over the phone. Um, well, it's not a vague question per se, but it can be heard two different ways. It could be heard as F, like file transfer protocol, or STP, which is what I said, you know, uh, where the spanning tree protocol is being used. And so based off of what they heard and how they answered, it would tell me, you know, again, where their experience lies and what they knew and whatnot. Um, it has been a very successful way for us to grade. Like we can usually tell pretty accurately from the answers, uh, along with the bio of the technician, how well they would uh, scale in an actual environment um, or how, how well they would score. Uh, to the point where, you know, we wouldn't know, we can't pin them exactly as, oh, you're tier three for sure. But we can say, have you met tier one requirements and are on your way to tier two? Have you met tier two requirements and on your way to tier three? And we would basically have an idea of where that is, of where they are with that. Um, and so we've successfully used it to hire a few people uh, and Telecom has successfully used it to hire a few people uh, that actually did a really decent job. Um, and, 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 you know, basically provided merit to the, uh, to the system that I was using to screen these people. Again, some of the arguments. And so like, this is a conversation, uh, an MSP geek, Kyle dropped these questions. Um, and Gavin replied, like, I'm not a fan of those questions. I'm much more a fan of testing logical approach and deduction capability instead. Yes, there's two parts to it. And I actually responded back, like, this is a longer conversation we should get on a video and talk about. I actually haven't checked to see if Gavin was available to jump on. Uh, but I'm happy to do a video with him to talk it out in more detail. Uh, the thing is, though, is that there are two sides to this. There's one side where, you know, we don't have the time to train someone. We need someone to hit the ground running so that they're coming in. We know that they have a background and in, in knowledge that'll get them to a tier two or more level. Um, and sure, we will continue to train them and get them onto the next part of their journey. Uh, but they can at least come in and make a significant impact within the first week, as opposed to expecting them three, three to four months to start actually providing them return back on hiring them. Um, another, uh, the other side of this is like what he said, if we can test for logical and deduction and critical thinking and problem solving, then that's someone that we can come in and we can train. It doesn't matter what they know. So that's it. That's basically um, a conversation that went on that I wanted to get off my chest. Hopefully this was interesting to you. Hopefully this helps. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, if you, one of the things that we do uh, in Rising Tide Consulting uh, now I feel like I'm turning this into a pitch and I feel kind of dirty, but I'm just going to say it. Um, we do help with interview, uh, interviewing employees, um, talking about like what you need and, and whatever. So if you want uh, that, if you want me to assist in that and help you build out an interview process or uh, help you screening employees and ask them questions, um, um, yeah, let me know. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.